we stay fluid in our team building, although, uh, and then really just creating, re uh, taking referrals from other people. Like that's been huge for us. So even when we were initially building that team, like we would be contacting a lawyer and maybe he didn't do SEC. So he was referring to us to someone who did, or we were talking to a broker who works with syndicators who knows like what lawyer they're using or what property manager other clients of his are using in the area. So really working off referrals has been huge for us. Welcome to the Real Estate Mindset Podcast, hosted by Eric Nelson and brought to you by Wild Oak Capital. Eric is a real estate investor, business owner, and performance coach. Throughout this series, Eric explores the mindset behind why certain investors are so successful and how we can learn from their achievements and failures. Eric asks the tough questions around the habits, discipline, mindset, and more required to achieve the most ambitious goals. Thank you for being here and enjoy the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Real Estate Mindset Podcast. This is your host, Eric Nelson. I'm super excited for the guest today. This is Savannah Arroyo, also known as the Net Worth Nurse, which is, like, is such a good nickname. <laughs> so welcome <laughs> on and thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you. I'm super stoked to be here. Cool. So we always start with, you know, if you could give us your background, where you're from, what you do and used to do, and then what led you into real estate. Definitely. I am from Northern California. I'm from Sacramento. I grew up there. I went to Sacramento State and got my nursing degree. And then after college, I worked in a couple of different specialties within nursing, went back to school and got my master's degree in nursing leadership and administration. And then since I've moved down to Los Angeles, California, and right now I oversee multiple departments at a hospital here in LA. I got into real estate investing uh, the beginning of last year. I was on maternity leave with my second daughter and my husband and I were just really learning about different ways that we could start investing to get kind of more money in our pocket. Now we had really just been putting the majority of our paychecks towards retirement accounts that we had through our employer. And we were just wanting uh, to kind of create some financial freedom and time freedom for us and our growing family. So uh, started looking into different strategies within real estate investing. And we started off buying single family homes, but then shortly after we moved into multifamily syndication, and really just because we love working with other people and kind of the team component that syndications allow us to do. And so uh, now we're doing multifamily syndications. Awesome. Um, so there's, there's a lot in there that you mentioned and I'll start with the team thing. So I, I completely agree. I mean, I love multifamily for that reason. I love syndications, it's kind of a teamwork thing uh, as opposed to kind of getting your own. So let's back up a little bit. Um, when you guys got into this, sounded to me like you had purchased a handful of single families and then realized, okay, we want to scale or how did, how did your push from single family to multifamily go? Yeah, really just wanting to scale at that point. We had bought two single family new build townhomes and we had really just kind of drained our capital or so we thought, I mean, we ended up learning as we started learning about real estate, we started learning about all these additional ways that you could start tapping into different capital sources like home equity or retirement accounts, different things like that. So since then we've tapped into different uh, capital sources, but we had initially just kind of uh, used all our capital in those deals and we were wanting wanting to do more. We, we felt after we kind of started researching different ways to scale a business and create a real estate business, we learned about multifamily syndications and a lot of people just kind of wishing they had moved into multifamily sooner in their real estate career. So after kind of hearing that from multiple people, we just started researching it ourselves, my husband and I, and as we started researching it and learning kind of like what it would take to run and operate a real estate business in the form of multifamily syndications, we really discovered that our skill sets that we have in our current W-2 jobs were really useful. I mean, right now I oversee operations for healthcare, multiple departments. So being able to bring those skill sets to running a multifamily operate syndication is huge. Yeah. I really love that outlook. I mean, um, bringing what you have already and then kind of utilizing that skill set. So a lot of people will say, well, I'm starting at zero. I don't know anything about this. And maybe the, maybe the knowledge base is, you know, lacking, 
which you can learn through podcasts or books or mentorship, but your skill set is something that you built over your career. So that's another thing I love about this is you can, you can translate, I mean, in your case, management or maybe running high paced, high volume situation, whatever it might be, you can translate those skills into real estate. So I really love that you said that. So um, next question I had for you would be, I've heard you on other podcasts talk about, you know, setting the goal and kind of starting there. So can you, you talk about where you guys started? I mean, I heard you say that you were looking into investing, heard about real estate, and then can you describe what that process was where you said, okay, let's look at the next 10 years type thing. Yeah, we are very, very specific with our goal setting. And this is something that I've really just kind of practiced. I mean, my whole life, like since I graduated high school, I was really into kind of the law of attraction and just different things to kind of be specific with what you want out of life and then making sure that you're taking the actionable steps to get there and achieve what you want. And so you're learning about the law of attraction and studying different like um, mindset coaches and different like self-help, like guru type people. I mean, Tony Robbins is huge for me. He was like the big goal setting, uh, person that I started following and just really his specific, uh, reasoning behind setting goals and, um, getting very specific with where you want and why, like your, why has to be so strong that it really just creates all this emotion now behind your goals. And it gives you a lot more motivation to get there. So, I mean, this is something I practice in my career with relationships, like spirituality, with my family life, friends, that sort of stuff. But when it came to, um, even my career, like real estate specifically, we got where we wanted our lives to look like in five years from now, 10 years from now, like when we woke up in the morning, what did our days look like involving real estate? Like what were we doing on a day-to-day hour basis really throughout our days? And when you look at it like that and get really specific with where you want to be and then kind of backtrack, okay, if we want to be here in five years, like what do we need to be doing at three years to get there? What do we need to be doing in a year from now? It really breaks down like even on a monthly to weekly basis, like how many deals we need to be underwriting? How many investor calls do we need to be having a week? Like how many deals do we need to do throughout the year to get to this point? And because we were so specific about where we want to be, it kind of laid out a blueprint for us of what we needed to be doing to get there. Yeah. I mean, I love that. I subscribe to that 100%. It's basically start with the end in mind. And maybe the most important thing you said, in my opinion, is the why. I mean, you're absolutely right. It's like, okay, 10 years from now, I want to be debt free and financially free. Great. But you know, why do you want that? Right. And so, you know, I, again, I subscribe to that fully. So I appreciate you saying that. So let's, let's get back into kind of the real estate pieces. You do multifamily syndications. Can you describe, uh, I understand you got a deal last year. Have you, have you done another one or what's kind of your personal portfolio now? I'm mean, actively looking, can you give us a, a update? Yeah, definitely. So we did our uh, first deal at the end of last year, 12 unit up in Oregon. And then we just closed last Friday on a 24 unit and uh, we're under contract for an 18 unit up in Oregon as well. So we're like mid, mid smaller size multifamily deals and uh, raising family really, or raising money from really friends and family at this point. And um, it motivated me to launch the net worth nurse just to provide kind of an educational platform for people in the medical field who don't necessarily know about real estate investing and want to get involved, but don't have the time and energy to be looking into what it takes to own real estate. And syndications really just provide a perfect opportunity for people to invest passively in these deals. So that's really now our big motivation behind doing what we're doing. Yeah, I mean, I love this. I love that because education is the key piece, you know, for, for the majority of people out there, syndication is not something you hear, you know, it's kind of like, well, what is that? And you know, a lot of people, it's almost like taxes. It's, it could be scary to not know anything about it, which is totally fine. So I love that you are into education. I'm the same way. I mean, that's the reason I started this one. I love the mindset piece, but two is to educate people on what is a syndication? What does that look like? What does that even mean? You know? Um, so I'm, I really love that you love that. And uh, we will definitely post your website in the show notes and stuff because I checked out your website. And it's awesome. I mean, even you, you have like a little Doodle sketch, is that what it's called? Yeah. Describing syndications. So uh, super cool. So let's get back to your syndications. You, it sounds like they're, I don't want to say small because I don't know the price range, but smaller unit wise. 
Or yes. have you syndicated the all three of those? Yes, we have syndicated all three. And so were they just the price point was high enough to put that syndication together? I mean, in my mind, there's kind of this threshold where it, it you know, there's some expense behind it, right? So maybe it's mm -hmm. either a really good deal or the price point. I mean, do you mind sharing a little bit more detail on those? Yeah, definitely. I mean, so for your example, our first one was a 12 unit, which I mean, a lot of people, when we were talking to them about it, were like, oh, you could JV it. You don't necessarily need to syndicate it, but we always had our mindset on syndication regardless. So for us, it was like, okay, we might as well jump into it and start learning how to syndicate to from the get-go and start. So for that deal, we raised from four investors, five, including us. And that was just all really family at that point. One nurse I worked with, but um, people really who knew what we were doing in real estate wanted to get involved. And uh, yeah, that first deal, I mean, was a million dollar price point. So we were using a local credit a union, couldn't even uh, apply for like agency debt at that point. So a smaller deal, but we jumped right into the syndication. And if you had to do it over again, would you change that? I mean, it's kind of cool that you got that experience. There's some regulation, obviously, and some attorney's fees. It's, yeah. it's great to get that experience. Had mm -hmm. you done it over, would you, would you perhaps have JV'd or would you say, no, it was definitely worth it? It was definitely worth it for us. I mean, just starting out and kind of where we were with our financial situation going and doing it, like we wanted to learn it. And so for us, it was just like a perfect opportunity to jump in there. It was a really strong deal. We're getting great returns for our investors. So, um, I mean, obviously, I mean, like down the road, as we start growing our portfolio and kind of just start snowballing our real estate wealth, I would say uh, the goal would be to potentially do something like that on our own or JV it down the, down the road. But for now, I mean, it was a perfect scenario to start with the syndications. Oh, very cool. So are all three of these in Oregon, you said? Yes. Uh huh. And so, I mean, I, I'm sure I'm not the first person to ask. That's not a typical, you know, location where people are looking for deals. And sometimes that's, sometimes that's a benefit, right? Are you seeing that, that, you guys are getting these deals and having good relationships with brokers. And then you, you have family in the area. Is that why you selected that market? Is that what I understand? Yes. So my parents live up in Oregon and honestly, it wasn't a market that we were initially looking into because like you said, you don't hear about it. Like I listen to podcasts all the time and I never heard about anyone investing in Oregon. And so we never even thought about looking there, but when we were like practicing our underwriting and starting to just like look at different markets and different deals and comparing like what different components of the underwriting look differently within markets. So we were just kind of really practicing and looking at deals up there and, we created a great relationship with a broker who we did all three deals with. We, and now, you know, we just have such an amazing team built up there. So it's really kind of snowballed our portfolio up there and the ability to do these deals up there. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there, you don't hear about it a, a lot. I mean, it's not a huge, hot, hot market, but I mean, it has Portland up there. I mean, it is growing. There's a, and the numbers work. I mean, I'm sure some people do shy away from markets that aren't like these huge, huge, like appreciating markets, but that doesn't mean that there's not amazing deals out there. I mean, we're finding kind of this perfect niche of these like smaller multifamily deals that are just kind of like mismanaged properties by previous owners. And they're just wanting to get rid of them. And we're coming in, getting them at great prices, able to implement a value add business strategy and create amazing returns for our investors. Yeah. I mean, that's what it all is. It's, yeah. it's all about the numbers, right? I mean, if, if it works for the investors, if you know the area and one thing you mentioned was your team, mm -hmm. so valuable to have a good broker on your side, good property manager, kind of know all the players there. Mm -hmm. That's so valuable. Mm -hmm. So you could kind of become, you know, the, the person there with that broker that, that looks for those deals. And I actually have talked about this a handful of times. I, you know, there are some under, there's a lot of competition in, in hundred plus units, obviously. Um, and I, I like that you're discussing these smaller properties. I mean, again, it's, it's all relative, right? But small as compared to the standard syndication you hear about, do you want to stay in that kind of zone or would you prefer, you know, in the future, if, if you could grow to a larger number of doors, I mean, do you have kind of a, a spot that you're looking for? I mean, so for now we're raising all our own capital initially after we did that first deal and we kind of like 
used our capital sources in terms of raising from friends and family. We were thinking that we were going to create strategic partnerships where we could bring on capital raisers for our deals. But then as we kind of just started researching it more and learning about like what other people were doing, we realized we had to build a brand regardless. I mean, initially we were trying to go the, the partnership with the capital raiser because we didn't want to be the brand and be out there marketing and pushing it. I mean, and now look at me as the net worth nurse, like pushing all my content out there on a very regular basis. But that was because we realized like, if we were going to get people to do deals with us and create a business and to do this eventually full time, like we had to establish a brand. So then we kind of just jumped over that hurdle and I launched the net worth nurse. And now my, our goal really is just to provide these opportunities to a lot of the people in our circles and continue to expand it. So as we're raising our ourselves for these deals, we were initially thinking like the stack method of, you know, 12 unit, then we went up to 24 and then the next one was like 18. So we're really at a good spot where we're at, but I mean, definitely looking into bigger deals is our end goal. Got it. And I remember you saying that you, um, looking at Atlanta as well, are you still looking there? Are you more focused in Oregon or, or both? We do still look in Atlanta because we have single family homes over there and we do know some brokers in the area, but that's a very competitive market. And, um, we're like a five hour flight over there. You know, we haven't even been to Atlanta, Georgia. So it's a little bit different to establish those relationships and start getting those really good deals because it is uh, pretty competitive over there. And actually after we did our 24 unit, we were looking to think like, okay, let's focus in Reno. Let's focus in Atlanta, a different market, but our broker up in Oregon just continues to send us these amazing deals that we can't pass up. So we're, we're there. Yeah, no, I mean, that's it is if the, if you continue to find deal flow that works for investors, then why change it? You know, it's obviously yeah. you, you might, you could branch out and look and continue to look, but yeah, I mean, Atlanta's to me is a little bit like Dallas. It's an awesome market. And if you can get in great, um, but it, it can be pretty competitive. So I understand that. Um, so one other thing I, I wanted to ask you was in, in regards to kind of how the timeline went. So you got a couple single families, got excited about syndication. And then for me, you know, first step in my mind is to contact brokers. When did you start the relationship with your attorney um, to begin the syndication? And then how did that process go? I and mean, have you had good luck with that attorney You're using that same team um, to get it all done? Do you know what I'm asking? I mean, was that timeline basically like broker, find a deal, get an attorney type thing. And then if, if you don't mind expanding on your experience with that. Yeah, definitely. So we were moving pretty quickly. My husband and I like, you know, work full time. We have our daughters at home after work. And then we, once we put them to debt bed, we're working pretty much full time on real estate for hours into the night. And so for us, it was very much like kind of doing everything all at once. It kind of felt like, you know, we were establishing relationships with brokers and property managers and contractors and lawyers all in the area, kind of having these conversations simultaneously so that when it came time to do a deal, you already kind of have a network of people. Since we've done our first deal, uh, we've kind of, we've switched contracting teams. Our initial contractor kind of made a big mistake uh, going out into that first deal. And so we moved contractor teams. Um, after the second deal, we're going to be switching lawyers just because as we've continued to immerse ourselves in all these like masterminds and networking groups, we're continuing to meet a lot of people and, um, and just creating different relationships and talking to people and learning about different styles of doing things. So we're going to be working, um, with a moving to a lawyer who specifically does syndications themselves. So that provides like a lot of value in terms of like what we want to do and continuing to grow our business. So, um, we stay fluid in our team building, although, uh, and then really just creating, re uh, taking referrals from other people. Like that's been huge for us. So even when we were initially building that team, like we would be contacting a lawyer and maybe he didn't do SEC. So he was referring to us to someone who did, or we were talking to a broker who works with syndicators who knows like what lawyer they're using or what property manager other clients of his are using in the area. So really working off referrals has been huge for us. Yeah. Word of mouth seems to be so powerful. I mean, I totally agree. Referrals, if you can get a reference from someone, that's just such a powerful tool. Mm -hmm. um, cool. So uh, again, this podcast is, is, based around mindset. So I have a, a handful of questions that I ask every guest 
and we can dive in as deep as you want. It sounds to me like you kind of like that stuff too. If you, you know, love if you it. Grab to Tony <laughs> Robbins. So um, we'll just jump right in. So the first question is, do you have a morning routine? Yes. Morning routine. So there are like a few things that I do definitely every day that are just like very important to me in terms of like what I'm able to get done on a day. So, uh, meditating in the morning, that's for sure. Uh, a routine of mine. I mean, honestly, in the mornings of my house, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, so they can be a little chaotic. So I wake up earlier to meditate before they get up. Occasionally I'll be recording podcasts before I go into work and before they wake up. So occasionally a couple of days a week, I'll be doing that. Um, but other kind of just like daily habits that I incorporate into my life. Like I'm really big on juicing. I do like mushroom supplements, different things like that. And then I have, um, like working out is huge for me. That's something I do like right when I get home from the hospital. And that's kind of like my mindset shift into like moving into mom mode, real estate mode, you know, turning <laughs> off the nurse mode. So that kind of just like re-energizes me for my second half of my day. So those are a few things that I definitely do every day. That's interesting. I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old at my house as well. Oh. So I completely understand the, <laughs> the chaos, but, um, all right. The next question is what books are you reading or what books do you recommend? Right now I'm reading, or the last two books I read were like crushing it by Gary V and, um, you are a badass at making money by Jen Sincero, just while capital raising, it can be just such a like salesy type feel. And I hate that. And so that book kind of just is a good mindset shift in terms of like, you're providing a service for people and just kind of the different ways to like talk about money to people. Uh, cause it can be such a taboo topic to talk about. Um, so those two books, but I mean, I love grit by Angela Duckworth, rich dad, poor dad, um, to, to Tony Robbins, like everything, his books are great. Those are some good mindset books. I love it. I, I love Jensen Cheryl's book. I mean, I, I recommended that on this podcast as well for that reason. Um, she, it resonated with me so strongly, exactly what you described is you're providing a service. And then, you know, she talks about a lot is having that mindset of, of you can, you can set this goal and you can achieve it. So yeah, I appreciate that recommendation. And yeah, there's just kind of a bottomless list of amazing books, but the ones yeah. you listed were super good. Uh, okay. The next actually kind of leads me into my next question because, uh, I'll just ask the question. <laughs> um, do you have a coach or a mentor? I've heard you talk about a mentorship program and then was it, was it worth the money or worth the time investment? Yeah. So we did sign up for a coach mentorship program when we switched into single family into multifamily. And that was because we were full force on wanting to do the syndication business. We wanted to build a real estate business. So for us, it was worth it to invest in a coaching program to have a second set of eyes looking over all of our underwriting to walk us through really the, the potential to make big mistakes, like expensive mistakes in multifamily syndications. And so for us, it was worth it to spend, you know, $30,000 on a coaching program to avoid making the $30,000 mistake in our real estate business. So, and because we were investing in the deals, we were planning to ask our friends and family to invest in our deals. So for us, that was super, super important, especially too, because we're working full-time jobs. We have two young daughters. And so we wanted to make sure that we were doing everything like the right way, like that we weren't missing anything. And that really, the coach mentorship program gave us the confidence to be submitting those offers to begin with, you know, having a deal overlooking at doing all our underwriting and having someone with, you know, 20 plus years of experience looking at it and saying, yeah, this is a good deal. Go ahead and submit an offer. It gave us the confidence to go ahead and do that. And, um, so for us, it was very important in terms of just kind of getting started and rolling into it. I do talk to people about this all of the time. I don't think the coaching programs are for everyone. I definitely don't think you need to have one in order to get going in this business, especially now that I've been in the networking with other people and all these meetups and masterminds. Like there are so many amazing resources and these free meetups that exist virtually due to COVID. You can hop on these meetups. There's people on there that are willing to sponsor you, be KPs on your de deals, LPs on your deals. Like I attend a mastermind every Tuesday night and there's 
insurance brokers, property managers, there's people vetting out operators and they're willing to sign on the loan and be sponsors for you when it comes to debt and that, like there's so many amazing resources out there through these networking. And I think kind of going back to it's a team sport, like you're a lot of it involves relationship building. And so that's something that a coach can't provide for you. Like after we did our first deal and we were looking to do our second one and we were looking to kind of like leverage different capital resources and it didn't end up working out through the coaching program that we were in. And honestly, it was a little bit discouraging to think that that was something that was like kind of incorporated in the coaching program. And it was kind of a dead end for us, but it really forced us to then launch our own brand and get out there and start establishing our own relationships with other people. Yeah. I mean, I think it could be a double-edged sword too. I mean, I, the reason I brought up Jensen Chero is because she is like a performance coach and a life coach, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. And her, her view on that was really hit home. So I, I tend to agree. I mean, I think the, the power you can gain from let's call it a real estate coach or mentor is exactly what you said is you can, you can gain some confidence and gain some knowledge. There's a ton of free knowledge out there, but what I really subscribe to at least recently is kind of that, that um, kind of high performance style coaching. And so that's why I asked that question. I mean, there's no right answer, of course, but that's that's the reason I was making that connection with, with Jen Sincero. She just uh, talks about that quite a bit in that book and it resonates with me as well. And I, th I think you're exactly right though. There is this point where you can almost use it at a crutch. It's like, yeah. you're not being yourself, you're being that mentorship program and you're kind of being robotic about what they're telling you to do. When there comes a time where it's like, you got to find your own way and, and run out there on your own. So you guys have done that. And that's, that's really, really cool. Yeah, definitely. I think I had heard it on a podcast about, you know, a lot of people use coaching when it comes to multifamily syndications, but even just thinking about other industries and high performance athletes, like every single one of them have coaches. And when I thought about it like that, I was like, oh, that that's fine. That like, it makes sense that to really kind of achieve and like work to be the highest version of yourself. Like it helps to have a coach coaching you through some of the difficult times that you're having. like, for us, the accountability piece, I know a lot of people do coaching also for accountability. Like we were definitely very, like, we didn't really necessarily need that, but I know that's something that a coach can provide that is huge for some people wanting to get started. Absolutely. I mean, everyone has their own thing. Um, I tend to be the same way. I tend to be kind of a doer. I'm just going to move forward no matter what. So the accountability piece wasn't there, but there's lots of people out there who might have a fear or, or take a take one step and kind of stop. And so, you know, not to, not to go too far into this, but I, you know, I believe in it. I believe it's worth the, the investment. And so um, I appreciate your kind of honesty with that. Yeah. Um, the next one is what is the biggest, we, I, I've stopped using the word mistake. <laughs> what is the biggest learning experience? What's something you've done that we can learn from that you wouldn't repeat? Yeah, definitely. So for our 12 unit, we were told by our broker that we could go in and turn in the storage space into a studio unit. So that was something that our broker told us initially about this property was a huge value add component. So we're like, perfect. This is super cool. He said like the previous owner had pulled permits on it, all this stuff. We uh, vetted out a contracting team and asked them like, Hey, this is what we plan to do with this unit. Can you go and look at it? Just make sure it's legit. We just want to make sure like we're doing all our due diligence on it. Like our business plan involves turning the studio store storage space into a studio unit. So like, we need to make sure this is like a foolproof thing. They're like, yeah, yeah, no problem. We get it. Um, we get the deal and then we're moving forward and our contractors start to go to like, um, pull permits and, it was, we were told no, basically. So the city said we couldn't do it. And it was so like, honestly, when I got that email, like my stomach dropped, you know, we have money invested in this deal. Like my, my father-in-law, like friends and family, like I just, I literally couldn't eat like the whole day. I was just like nauseous almost knowing that. And it was so frustrating, but for us, it was like, a good reminder that relying on other people to like do their best job, like doesn't always cut it, you know, like for me as a nurse, like we, I guess we just put too much trust into these contractors that they know how to do their job. And it was honestly so discouraging and defeating because I know when I have patients come into the hospital and I'm there getting them ready for surgery, you know, like having them sign the consent, I'm starting an IV, like asking them all these questions, getting them ready for the surgery. Like they're trusting that I know what I'm doing, you know, that I wouldn't kind of do anything to put them in harm or do anything that was like wrong to not set them up for success 
through the procedure. And so for us to know that the contracting team, obviously they felt horrible. I mean, it wasn't enough for us to repair the relationship. We, we definitely moved on to a different contracting team because of it, but it was just like being accountable for everything. And just like, even if you think like you're asking so many questions, like, do you know what you're doing? Like, did you do this? Like it can, can kind of feel like, and some people will think, oh, they don't think I can do my job, but feeling confident that you can ask these questions to your teammates just to have a better understanding of it is like a huge takeaway that we learned from that. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good tip and a, and a super frustrating thing that happened to you. So my day job, I do engineering and planning work for a living. And so I hate to say this, but this happens all the time. So if someone buys a property, nothing against real estate agents, they probably don't know. They're told by the real estate agent, oh yeah, you can build this or do this. You know, again, in 99% of the cases, probably not maliciously without really knowing the land use code. And so then you go in and the city or county says, no, you can't do that. There's a thousand reasons why that might be a no. So unfortunately that happens all the time, you know, but I don't want to hone in too much on this particular thing because what, what the point was is, yeah, due diligence is, is tricky and it, it can, you know, it can take you all over the place, but you're right. You have to, you have to trust your team, but ask a million questions and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to ask questions. This is kind of what I was hearing from that. So appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. And I think kind of like the mindset piece of when that happened, like my husband and I like, yeah, let it sit with us for a second, like felt the sting and the burn of it. But then we're like immediately thinking of like, okay, well, what do we do next? Like, how do we pivot around this? Like, what do we do to kind of solve the problem? What else can we do to still get these great returns for our investors? Like what else can we like kind of overcompensate on? And it was really just like pivoting and then going forward from there, not dwelling too much on the mistake. Oh, I love that tip. I mean, that's it. The mistakes are going to happen. Uh -huh. Your business plan will never go exactly as you thought. So if you have the mentality of, all right, that, that didn't work. Let's move on, you know, <laughs> not eat for a day. And then next day, get a biggest burrito you can and just move on, you know, <laughs> so that's yeah. a, that's a really exactly. awesome. Thing. Um, and this actually is, I mean, it's funny. This is the next question is what mindset tips can you give someone that's starting out to kind of help them propel? Yeah, I think kind of going back to kind of how we started the conversation of just like leveraging other skills in your life to apply to what you want to do in real estate. Like I know that even in my nursing career, like within six years of being a nurse, I've like navigated through a bunch of different positions and specialties and leadership roles within different hospitals I've worked at. And I almost never had experience for the jobs I was applying for. And a lot of people would look at these, like, you know, my first time going into a supervisor role, I had zero supervisor experience. And on the application, it said like supervisor experience was required, all this stuff. And I really just went into the interview and like contacted someone through LinkedIn and HR and started like trying to find all these ways so I can get in front of the person that was interviewing for this job and basically explaining to her like, Hey, I saw this job posting. Like, I think I would be the perfect fit because of this. Like, yeah, I don't have any of this experience or this experience, but this is all the amazing skill sets I can bring to the table. Like I'm a great leader. I have accountability. You know, I, I really love my work, that sort of stuff. So being able to bring other skill sets to like what you want to do is so important. And I think also not trying to reinvent the wheel, like think and grow rich is one of my all time favorite books. And it really, that book focuses on kind of looking towards people where, where you want to be, someone's doing what you want to be doing in the future. Right. And learning what did it take for them to get there? I mean, his, his whole journey was interviewing like all these amazing people in high status jobs are happy with life and just rich in their mindset, not just with money, but in life and interviewing these people of like how they got there. What, what were they doing to get there? And in real estate, I mean, there's people doing Airbnbs and flipping and multifamily, uh, skilled nursing facilities, land. Like if you know kind of what you want to do and you know, out some like look on social media and you see someone out there who's killing it in Airbnbs and you love what they're doing, like reach out to them, ask how they got there, ask if they have any any tips on how you can get started and get to where you want to go? I mean, that is huge. Yeah. There's a handful of things in there. I, I want to kind of go back to. So the first thing is don't necessarily have to put yourself in a box. So you were applying for a job that you didn't technically go for on paper. Right. But you were like, I don't care. 
I know I can do a good job. I'm going to, I'm going to find the person and I'm going to show them why. So I love that tip is don't, don't limit yourself to what the, the, you know, anything. I mean, if whatever that job says on the job description, if you can nail it, give it a shot. So I love that tip. And then the second ones was finding someone who's, who's five, 10 years ahead of you. I've said that before on the show is that's super powerful is to find someone who's doing what, what you want to do. Yeah. And then just reach out and say, Hey, what did it take to get there? What did you do? What are the steps or your pitfalls? You know, I, if I learn from those things, I can go as fast or faster than you. And it's absolutely possible because there's someone standing right in front of you that did it. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's, those two things were just amazing tips. So I appreciate you <laughs> honing in on those. Okay. The next question I think to me is a little bit more difficult. So uh, what is your definition of success? Success for me is definitely happiness through life balance. I am super driven and I can get very caught up in achieving through my career and my business and just kind of over the last couple of years and having my daughters and seeing what it's like life from your children's eyes. It's just so much more than what we're doing at our jobs. I mean, for me, it's mind blowing that a lot of people are spending 40 hours a week at jobs that they hate. Like that's absolute insanity to me. Like we have one life to live and I just could not imagine waking up every morning and not wanting to be doing something or being forced to do something that you don't want to do. And for us, I mean, that was a huge motivation going into real estate was, you know, there's some days where I wake up and I'm like, Oh, I don't necessarily want to go to the hospital, but like, you know, here I am, but I wanted to not feel this way until I'm 65. You know, I know nurses that are dragging themselves into work at 65, 66, I mean, in 70 and not wanting to be there, but have to be financially. And for my husband and I, we just did not want to be doing that our whole lives. And so by investing in real estate and creating this business, I mean, we're lucky we love it so much. So we're so passionate about it that it's honestly fun for us, but to create, use this tool of real estate investing to create all this financial freedom for us is like very huge for us. And then, I mean, it's a good reminder, even like, you know, I grind on my nursing stuff and my real estate stuff, mostly throughout the week, but then on the weekends, like are very much my family time. I go do like a solo run on the beach. That's like my me time. I spend time with my daughters, you know, my husband and I go, maybe go out to dinner. I see friends. Like it's very much a life balance for me. Yeah. Awesome answer. I really, really love that. Um, so this one again is, is probably a difficult question for a lot of people, but if someone asks you, why are you successful and, and others not so much? What is your thinking behind that? Probably taking action. I am just like, if there's something I want, my next question is like, well, what, what, what needs to happen to get there? And I mean, it's shocking. Like I set a goal at the end of last year to be on a hundred podcasts this year. So that was my goal for a lot of different reasons. I love connecting with people like yourself, you know, big people out there in the real estate industry. I love marketing. I love sharing my story to hope it motivates other people. So a lot of different reasons behind why I wanted to do these podcasts. So I've been doing it and I reach out to people. I try and get on podcasts and you won't believe the amount of people that ask me like, Hey, how are you getting on so many podcasts? Like I've seen you everywhere. How are you getting on these podcasts? And I'm like, well, what do you mean? I'm just reaching out to people who have podcasts and I'm asking if they, I could be on them, you know, but people don't even think about that. Like to them, that's cold calling. Like literally when I graduated nursing school, I was one of those nurses that like printed out my resume on a nice piece of paper and walked it into the hospital and handed it to managers. And like other nurses would be like, wait, what are you doing? You're going into the hospital. And like some managers would look at me and like, just throw it in the trash right in front of me. But the ones that loved it, loved it. They were like, oh my God, I love that you walked it in here. You have a face to name. It just makes it more personal. So like, it just kind of blows my mind that I guess people maybe don't realize like, it's not super hard. It's just like you realizing what you want to do and then like what it takes to get there. Yeah. I mean, I completely agree. It's, it's persistence. It's taking action. I mean, those are kind of the things that, that tend to separate people. So I, I love that question and I really appreciate your answer. So do you have, and, and uh, I hope I'm not asking something too personal because you, you obviously love your job, but do you have a timeline set where you want to transition to full-time real estate or is that not really defined yet? 
Um, it's definitely defined <laughs> I have a, I have goals for everything. Right. So, um, I mean, ideally our goal is to get my husband into like the full-time real estate and, uh, professional before, um, within the next like three years is our goal with that. I mean, me ever since I started nursing, I've always had my eyes set on like a CNO position, just kind of just a, a growing within leadership roles within healthcare organization. I'm super passionate about operations and just connecting on a personal level 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 with like caregivers and being a leader within a ministry, like what I'm doing now, I love it so much. It brings so much fulfillment to my life that it'd be really hard to give that up. I mean, I'd probably have to take like a baby step down and maybe do part-time and that would be awesome. Um, but maybe, I mean, like that'd be a, a 10 year goal for me, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I like it. <laughs> All right. Savannah, thanks so much for taking the time. I mean, there's so many good, good tips in here and, and, you know, real estate and mindset wise. So this has been a great episode. Really appreciate you taking the time. How can our, how can our listeners find you? Um, can you, can you tell them how they can reach out and find you? Yeah, definitely. So the net worth nurse, you can find me under the net worth nurse on all social media handles. So Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram, my website's the net worth nurse, my email Savannah at the net worth nurse. And I love connecting with other people. I love connecting with other people interested in real estate, especially healthcare professionals. So if you're remotely interested in anything I'm saying, please reach out. I would love to connect. Sounds great. Well, thank you again. Thanks for being here and have a great evening. Welcome to the Real Estate Mindset Podcast, hosted by Eric Nelson and brought to you by Wild Oak Capital. Eric is a real estate investor, business owner, and performance coach. Throughout this series, Eric explores the mindset behind why certain investors are so successful and how we can learn from their achievements and failures. Eric asks the tough questions around the habits, discipline, mindset, and more required to achieve the most ambitious goals. Thank you for being here and enjoy the show.